Hello and welcome to another episode of the 16-Bit Thief Podcast. As per usual, I am your host, Jake Milton. There was an old website called The Killer List of Video Games, which was dedicated to documenting arcade games. Kalov was responsible for how I got a good chunk of my video game knowledge. One day, as a wee lad, I stumbled upon a game called The Outfoxies. Released by Namco in 1994, The Outfoxies is a platform fighter that was completely unconventional from other fighters of the time. Despite its exotic flair and fresh take on the genre, The Outfoxies remains a very obscure title that few are aware of. Interestingly, The Outfoxies was heavily influential in the game design of numerous other titles, including Killer7, Super Smash Bros., and even Star Wars The Force Unleashed 2's multiplayer mode. I've always been curious why this title flew under the radar, yet impacted other developers. I reached out to lead designer Masatera Umeda and decided to inquire more about The Outfoxies, as well as his time at Namco and his current whereabouts. Without further introduction, let's get this show started. Question number one. What led you to initially join the video game industry, Namco specifically? Would you or have you ever considered going back to working in that field? Initially, Umeda was keen on making movies, but the movie industry in Japan had no future for that age range among his generation. He wasn't so special either. Some of those talented young people went to Hollywood and some decided to make video games instead of movies. Umeda actually hasn't left the video game business and runs the company Point Zero since then. He even went back to Namco for about three years, over a decade ago. Question number two. What games did you work on? At Namco, his games were Neto Gekito Quizto, The Outfoxies, Kosodate Quiz My Angel, Dancing Eyes, and Dr. Kawashima's Brain Training Arcade. The titles in which he only helped work on were Phantomers, Galaxian 3, Quiz Makyu Daiboken, Namco Classics Volume 1, Tekken, Abnormal Check, and Xevious 3DG. Question number three. What was the atmosphere like at Namco and in the game industry as a whole? He worked at Namco twice. The former was in the 1990s and the latter was the late 2000s. He felt the dramatical difference between those two ages of Namco. In the 1990s, it was like a university lab. Everyone was doing his own subjects separately, and no one lived a regular life. For example, he went to his office in the afternoon and said hello to a guy who had came to work at midnight, preparing to go home. In the busy season, most male employees were spending many nights on their chairs lined up in a linear manner like beds. Violation of orders were a daily event. If you were determined to make what you wanted to make, you should make it involving newbie programmers and designers, and if it was good, you would be forgiven and the game would be on the product line. What developers said was absolute. The peripheral department was having hard times selling what they created. In the 2000s, the company had transformed into a very normal one. The charismatic Masaya Nakamura had resigned as a chairman by that time, and a marketing consultant from outside of the company was brought in. In the olden ages, young students who aspired to be in the game businesses were the weird ones. But by that time, the game industry in Japan was welcome to society, and the students who aspired to be designers were no longer considered weird. Compared to that, the atmosphere at Namco in the 90s was very special. He's hardly seen companies like that nowadays, except maybe Google. Question number four. What have you been up to since leaving Namco in the 90s? In the 90s, there was the huge console war between Sony, Nintendo, and Sega. Developers wanted more game creators to their camps. And since then, he solicited some of his Namco co-workers to found the company Noise, famous for the first custom robo game on N64. Long before that, he resigned from Noise and founded Point Zero. In Japan, there's a giant company called Recruit that takes care of college students and helps give them jobs. Recruit and Nintendo jointly invested to create a company called Marigold Management. Marigold itself is a portmanteau of Mario and Seagull. The Seagull itself is Recruit's mascot and is possibly named after Seagull Jonathan, a bestseller for students at the time they established Recruit. Marigold's mission was to recruit game creators to manage their company and publish their games. They even lended funds for creators with no interest. During that time, he was playing Ultima Online, pretending to be producing a super innovative new game. It had the same concept as The Sims. But Max has published Sims a half a year faster than him, and he felt that their job was much better than what he was working on. Question number five. The Outfoxes is unique in that it plays nothing like the conventional fighting games of the time. Where did the decision to make the gameplay more free flow with items come from? Umeda had always wanted to make a platformer action game for single players, like Ghosts and Goblins, Flashback and so on, full of gimmicks and epic stage effects, plenty of traps, and so on. But at the time, making those games for arcades was out of the question. Those kinds of games require enormous budgets and produce much less income than fighting games and have an overall shorter playtime. Their aim was one coin for every three minutes. Making players fight each other was one of the most sophisticated solutions for the subject. But, the typical fighting games of the time had some issues. One, they were too common. Two, Street Fighter II was too perfect, and nobody could ever beat it in terms of popularity. Three, the skill ceiling was too high for newcomers. And four, he didn't even like them. So, he decided to put all of the stages and gimmicks into the arenas and set items in them. 
He thought picking named items are much more easy to understand than operating characters' limbs separately with each button. Question number six. Many critics, who have played the game, compare the Outfoxies to action films and later works of Suda51. What were primary influences for the character designs and overall tone? Hollywood movies from the 1980s were the biggest influence. He believes that for a certain period they were trying to discover new stages for action scenes. Indiana Jones or 007 or John Batum's action films are just a few examples he listed. They also invented epic action scenes and connected them by skewering the stories. Question number seven. While the Outfoxies went unnoticed upon release, it has garnered more praise over time for being wildly innovative and unique. Despite this, boards for the game are now incredibly rare and expensive. Do you happen to have an idea on how many were produced? He doesn't remember, but he says no more than 900, but no less than 1,000. Question number eight. Were there ever plans to make an Outfoxy sequel or spiritual successor? Noise was trying to make a 3D version of it when they first started, but after he resigned, the plan was canceled. Personally though, he's content with the original until the time when he can make a game in which children, animals, and people in wheelchairs kill each other and die bloody deaths comes again. Question number nine. Both the Outfoxies and Dancing Eyes never received modern re-releases. Were there ever plans to port either games to a home console? I know Dancing Eyes did have a planned Namco Generations reboot that was canceled. There was a plan to include it on one of those Namco Classic Collections for the PS2 around 15 years ago, but it was canceled last time he had heard. Question number 10. Dancing Eyes plays similarly to 1981's Kix, albeit with power-ups and a more erotic flair. Where did the idea come from to make an erotic puzzle game? Did the game go through different drafts and revisions before the final product? That's me all right to associate it with Kix, Umeda says. There was another game that also links the two, Kaneko's Gal's Panic. Gal's Panic was 2D and its gameplay itself was almost perfectly the same as Kix, but they drew girls in bathing suits for the backgrounds. It was the successor to the undressing Mahjong games which were massive in the Japanese market at the time. In the prototype version of Dancing Eyes, girls appear in all the stages and you can dress them to be totally naked. Neat. At the conceptual stage, he was thinking about drawing analog lines similar to Kix or Gal's Panic, but due to technical limitations, he changed them to follow the cracks of the polygons. Question number 11. Was there any controversy from the higher-ups about the content of Dancing Eyes? Was pitching it to the higher-ups a hassle at all? In the office, no one was angry, but there was a bit of worrying. The production started as a secret project with no product number assigned. He held a presentation to examine the prototype in-house, and it became one of the most exciting and successful presentations in his entire life. All the employees who rushed to the site praised it, so the supervisors had to give it the go-ahead. He thinks that him and even the higher-ups were on the same page at that very moment. One of Umeda's motivating factors for making Dancing Eyes was dissatisfaction that, in spite of exploring real-time 3D graphics, they kept making the same old racing or fighting games without any creativity or ingenuity. With the advent of 3D boards based on PlayStation hardware, such as the System 11, they were able to challenge new possibilities with a lower risk. He even recalls that Sega blamed them thoroughly for exhibiting Dancing Eyes at a trade show. Question number 12. How successful was Dancing Eyes? Did the game receive positive marks at location tests? While audiences did seem to laugh along with it and enjoy the game, and it did make pretty good income, the test was held around the same time as Kosodate Quiz, and in-house reputation was shifted to that one as a result. Question number 13. Kosodate Quiz My Angel was an interesting mixture of quiz game and life racing sim, yet it was an arcade exclusive title. Where did the whole life sim and quiz combo idea begin from? Now this answer was only left half translated, and the translators I used weren't much help, so I decided to at least cover some of the factors that Umeda wanted to consider when making the title. Initially, Kosadate Quiz was a PS1 game that migrated to arcade and would end up becoming his biggest success at Namco. The main idea was a solution for the following conditions. Firstly, a small developer brought a plan to Namco. The company was working with another company that can make outdated but very cheap 2D boards and had been proposing it to use it to make a crappy volleyball game. He witnessed this presentation because it was vacant due to the failure of the Outfoxies. While Tekken was successful at the time, it ended up bleeding much of Namco's manpower and budget. Namco's research and development team were competing with Sega for new 3D technology, but they didn't have the line to make an inexpensive product. Therefore, the proposal of adding one product without using in-house manpower itself was admirable, but the possibility of success of this beach volleyball plan was apparently zero. Second, he'd been assigned to a quiz game before, and it was successful. Third, said outdated board was perfect for a quiz game. Fourth, in spite of all of this, he hated quiz games because he wasn't much of a fan of them. Fifth, a major quiz game at the time was Capcom's Quiz Tonosama no Yabo, which came from Nobunaga's ambition. His first quiz game was Neto Gekito Quizto, which was inspired by SimCity. Gainax's Princess Maker was also very popular at the time as well. 
At that time, the phrase four couples was popular in the arcade industry. Japanese game centers were entering a period of cleaning in which they were banishing criminals and otakus and inviting healthy couples and families into their centers. The men were more likely to spend a lot of money to impress their girls. Because quiz games were so big in Japan at the time, Umeda wanted to try something completely different from what others were doing. He was heavily inspired by popular RPGs such as Dragon Quest and Koei's strategy titles like Nobunaga's Ambition. Umeda set out to make a game very similar to them in that regard, but also wanted to keep the spirit of the initial quiz games he was going to make. And thus concludes another episode of the 16-Bit Thief Podcast. I want to thank Masatera Umeda for agreeing to do an interview over his time at Namco and his work on the Outfoxies, Dancing Eyes, and Kosodate Quiz. Really hoping we get to see that beta version of Dancing Eyes sometime soon. I also want to apologize for not being able to cover his entire answer about Kosodate Quiz, but hopefully I'll be able to someday soon. That's all the time I have for this episode. Be sure to check out the next episode in which I interview a developer who worked on Sega's criminally underrated classic, The Ocean Hunter. Until then, this is the 16-Bit Thief, signing off.